Here we go, and welcome everyone to, um, uh, to our webinar series. My name is Michael Ogia. I am the Advocacy and Engagement uh, Manager at the Global Forum for Media Development, and I am so happy to welcome you all. Uh, basically, you know, we have been working with, uh, with ASML Syria, our, uh, one of our members, for, um, for many months trying to, to, bring it, to get this together and bring it to you all. So we are really overjoyed that we can finally present this webinar to you all. Um, basically, my I just want to I want to really give my a brief introduction to my own role in this. I'm here very much to to just welcome you and to be the uh, to to join uh, my colleague Jordan as the face of GFMD. But essentially, this time this space is meant to uh, for um, for ASML Syria and for our partners and our members who are joining the call to discuss the issues, especially Syria. There's so much happening at the moment. There are, uh, uh, especially as it relates to journalists on the ground, that it's, it's you know, important that we hear from those organizations working on the ground and from the journalists working on the ground to understand what their situation is like. Before I uh, pass the floor to uh, Chomsi from ASML Syria, I wanna say a few things. The first thing is that um, these uh, webinars are really meant to be a very informal space for discussion uh, among our members and partners. Um, so, you know, please feel free to engage. And uh, on those same lines, um, a few kind of housekeeping things just to remind everyone of. One is that if you would like to send a chat message, please make sure that you send it to all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you want to say. Um, you, can, uh, you can use the chat function for your questions, or there's also the Q&A function. But once we come to questions, um, you can also, uh, you'll also be able to, to raise your hand uh, via the participants um, tab on the bottom, and you can raise your hand and we can also give you the chance to speak. Um, joining us today are, are quite a few um, individuals and I will and uh, Shomsky, I'm sorry, Shomsky, who is, uh, who is um, uh, the uh, director of ASML Syria will give more inf information about the background of this and uh, will welcome you properly. So with that said, I just want to thank you all again for joining. I will come in at the end of it to uh, uh, during the farewell session. But for now, Shomsky, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. Um, first of all, um, I would like to welcome everybody here. Um, hopefully, we have been uh, finally able to, to have this webinar, uh, which, uh, as Michael just mentioned, has taken several months to prepare, uh, first as a, as a research that has been uh, published now by uh, our organization, ASML Syria, that I chair. Um, and with the help of the GFMD that I would like to uh, to thank very warmly. Um, the, the topic uh, of, of this webinar today uh, is called Disposable Journalist, Locally Injured Journalist and the Future of Conflict Reporting. Of course, this research has been made about journalists in, in Syria, but I think uh, it is very important to have in mind that this situation will probably be the same in many other conflict in the, the future. And uh, I think it's really time to think about the relation between these uh, mainly citizen journalists and their contractors, employers, or collaborators, sometimes uh, nationals uh, from, from also living in the, in the country where the conflict is, is present. Um, I would like to, to thank all the, the panelists present today with us. Uh, but before that, uh, I, I have special thanks also for uh, Caroline, who is uh, with us today. Uh, Caroline Bissier, who helped us organize all, all this and coordinate this, uh, this webinar. Um, so we will have today Yara Bader from the Syrian Center of the, uh, for Media Freedom of Expression. Um, Ayman um, Hanna from the Samir Kassir Foundation, uh, Ignacio Miguel Delgado from the Committee to Protect Journalists, and Mustafa Dahnon, uh, a freelance Syrian freelance journalist, uh, who will uh, will be a witness uh, 
about how he 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 had this experience once he got injured in in Syria and the relation he had with uh, with the people he was working with. And of course, uh, we will have Armand Uro, the former director of ASML Syria, who conducted this uh, this research from A to Z. Um, and I I would like to to thank him very warmly about all the effort he gave to to this uh, research that he initiated and terminated. Uh, and he will present today the main findings uh, of, of this research. I won't take more time. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to say uh, these few words um, and uh, I will let you continue um, this, this webinar. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank, thank you very much, Shamsky and uh, Shamsi. And uh, uh, with that said, I think, um, Yara, would you like to say a, a couple words as well as our moderator, or um, shall we, we can, shall we um, open it to our speakers? Um, I will, I will, I would, uh, I would thank you all. Um, thank you for, for the magnificent opportunity uh, to discuss a very important uh, subject. I'm Yara Badr from Syrian Center for Media and freedom of expression. It's really an honor to be here with you all. Thank you, Shamsi and Armand. It's, it's a magnificent report. Seriously, I advise everyone to, to, to deeply uh, read it and think carefully about it. It's, it's face us with a very important questions. I will leave Armand uh, to, to, to speak more about it. And then I will make a short, small, uh, which is very difficult introduction to the brilliant uh, panelists we have here. And then we have one question for each one and give the floor for you audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yara. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, so let's get started. Um, just have to share my screen. And so, um, Apparently, I cannot uh, share my screen, uh, Jordan. Sorry, 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 uh, Shamsky. Uh, sorry, Apparent hold, on. hold on just a second. Apparently, you deactivated the. It's just the security feature. And here you go. Now you should be able to. Amazing. My pl our pleasure. All right. Um, so, the starting point of the study is that there is there was um, two main factors. The first one is that in 2018, ISML, when I was um, director of um, the organization, we launched a project of assistance to the local Syrian injured journalists. And um, when we were doing that, we realized that actually the need um, that was actually much wider than we expected because there were a greater number of local Syrian journalists who got injured during the conflict who did not receive uh, support or did receive a support that was not uh, enough to, uh, to the needs. So that was the, the first uh, factor that made us think about um, launching this report. And the second is an article that was published in Syria Direct, which is called uh, Canon Fodder in the Search for News, that was looking at violation in the relationship between journalists and their employer, a violation that puts the, the journalists at risk. So this article was very interesting. Um, however, they only conducted a survey among 14 journalists. So it was not uh, really representative enough to give us um, the entire picture. So, so at ISML, the underlying reflection was that um, NGOs and ISML specifically should intervene in specific cases to bridge an identified gap, like as a band-aid, if, if I might say. Um, but if we're like in presence of a widespread systemic problem, the, the response may, may be different. In other words, um, NGOs intervention in favor of injured journalists should not be an excuse or justification or pretext for the employer not, not to meet their obligations. So we really wanted to have a, um, to launch a report that could give us like a representative um, picture of what's going on in terms of, uh, of uh, news reporting in Syria. And um, so the study, uh, the objective of the study was 
to investigate the safety conditions in which Syrian local journalists were immersed when and after they were injured, and whether the employer at the time respected the international consensus around minimum safety standards. So we're really looking at uh, injured journalists who received an injury that happened after 2011, the start of the Arab Spring, and um, and, this, and then that, get in, that got into a, a civil war. So um, in terms of um, methodology, we adopted in coherence with the UN Plan of Action for the Safety of Journalists, a broad definition of journalists. However, we decided to exclude those working for media departments uh, of an organization whose goal is not to provide information. So for example, political bodies, local coordination committees, local NGOs, uh, et cetera. And obviously we also excluded those who uh, were working or once worked uh, for an armed group, whether fighting or even like in a communication uh, capacity. So we um, made a questionnaires that were circulated among um, injured journalists and um, like in, within our network and within the networks of our collaborators, partners and the other uh, organizations that we contacted to have like um, this being uh, as widespread as possible, but still for the respondents to be vetted. So once we, um, we've done that, we um, did a, a qualitative approach as well with long interviews with 11 of them, of the journalists, local journalists, as well as interviews with Syrian media representatives, so Smart News, Anna Baladi, also with a representative of international media, like the IFP or Anadol, and uh, with NGOs such as um, CPJ and Ignacio is here and uh, SCM represented by uh, Yara. So um, in terms of, um, of sample, so we um, had responses from 72, 72 injured journalists after we excluded um, those who did not meet the, the standards. And uh, most of them were injured more than once. So 44, 44% of them had received one injury, but, um, but the rest had received two or even more injuries. And we, um, the approach is to um, investigate each injury. So not to, uh, to carry out the research per journalist, but really per injury, because um, each injury had like different circumstances and uh, the journalist was working for a different media maybe, and uh, was in different step like, um, moment in his life with different equipment, et cetera. So we, injure, and we um, investigated the 119 um, um, injuries. And um, to see if the obligation were respected from, um, from the from em employer's part, we had to establish what is the international consensus on best practices in terms of uh, the media organization, so the, the, the employer. So we, um, as you know, um, there is, most of you know at least, there is no uniform binding legal, legal like framework that can apply to local journalists and international media around the world. So we decided um, to look at what um, the international institutions like the UN and what NGOs have been working on for decades and um, what they come up in terms of general principles and good practices to be endorsed by the media industry. So we looked at many different initiatives. There are like a lot of them. For example, just to quote um, some of them, there is a Reporter Without Borders Charter of Freelance um, Rights in 2006, 2006, but also um, the Charter for the Safety of Journalists Working in War or Dangerous Areas in 2002, the UN Plan of Action for the Safety of Journalists in the Issue in, of Impunity in 2012, and more recently, the um, ACOS Alliance, a culture of safety, which has a more unified approach to embed a culture of safety within news organizations. So we try to look at common, de common denominator between all these, um, these initiatives, basically what has remained consistent across all of them. And um, so we decided to pick just three of them that are really like internationally uh, recognized as a pillar of the, of the relationship between the employer and the journalist is the first one that news organizations should ensure the journalist is appropriately equipped and trained to cover the story. And if they're not, the organization should provide him or her with the appropriate safety and first aid training and protective equipment. The second is that when in the event of injury or kidnap of a journalist, the media organization should take responsibility to provide the necessary support. 
And the third one, which is uh, also very important and recognized is that editors and news organizations should show the same concern for the welfare of local journalists and freelancers that they do for their own staff. So if like those principles were applied um, widely, um, the report sh should show like very good performance in terms of um, support and security training and security equipment. However, it's not the case. Um, so in terms of post-injury support, so basically any support received by the journalists uh, from their employer after in the event of an injury. So we're talking about, for example, logistic support to uh, be evacuated from the scene, administrative support to be uh, to get like um, a visa in Turkey, for example, to be able to cross the border or um, medical support or even psychological support or of course, financial support. Uh, only 24% of injured journalists received that from the employer after the injury. Um, in terms of um, security training before the injury, we realized that only 22% had received security training and it was provided by the employer only in 12% of cases. And it's even worse with security equipment as uh, only 16% of injured journalists received it, uh, provided by the employer in 18% of cases. So this is uh, obviously very bad performances and um, very uh, dire, like paints a really dire situation. And uh, this has long lasting consequences because um, when we interviewed the journalists, uh, we realized that 85% of them who um, still have not recovered from one or multiple injuries. Um, so we, well, I mean, we decided to try to go beyond just the description of facts and of uh, the situation and try to, uh, to look at what are the factors that can account for such uh, bad performances, especially for uh, principles that are so widespreadly, you know, I mean, accepted in a widespread manner and make consensus. So the first thing that one can think of is that most of the local journalists are working for, for local media and the Syrian media sector is nascent, has uh, not so much resources. So we can imagine that the international media um, treat their journeys very well. And uh, this poor number, um, the reason is that lo lots of them are working for um, low resources uh, organizations. However, when we look at the numbers, it's more complicated than that. Um, because when we make the comparison, the Syrian media don't, really seem to be outperformed by the international media in terms of their support to, uh, to their journalists. So the comparison and those figures need to be taken with caution because uh, the it's difficult to make a direct comparison because the sample size is very different from the journalists who worked for international media 20 and the um, situation where the journalists were working for Syrian media like 112. Um, the reason why it's, the numbers don't add up in terms of um, the number of total injuries that if you remember were 119, is that some of them were working for both international media and Syrian media when they got injured. So they were contained in both categories. Um, so we cannot really make comp um, direct comparison, but what this uh, figure shows us is that um, the, uh, the um, Syrian media is not outperformed by international media and the numbers are quite similar. Especially, and even though the international media have much more resources, much more um, uh, networks and, um, and access to more funding and connections basically. So what we looked at in terms of the main factors that explain this poor performance is first um, the fact that local journalists we realized have lived very little understanding of their rights. Um, and because of that, they do very little to have them enforced. So in the case of a journalist who work as freelance um, for a news organization, sometimes we realized that they got injured and they did not even tell the news, the, their client, the, the, the employer, the news organization. And so it's difficult to blame the news organization for not providing support for something that they don't have any information about. So that's the first thing. 
And really, that was really widespread. Um, almost all the journalists working as freelance did not consider that the media had any obligations toward them. Um, and um, and the second um, the second factor is that um, news organization accepting unsolicited content from local freelance journalists. So this is um, a problem because everyone agrees that um, if a news organization is not sending um, a journalist, commissioning a journalist to cover a story, they cannot be uh, um, responsible for the risks they're taking. And that's pretty straightforward. However, the problem, and I'll try to finish uh, quickly, is that um, most of the journalist content which is captured from Syria and published on international media or uh, Syrian media seems to fall within this category of unsolicited content. And sometimes it seems to be a growing trend in the sector. And it's a way for uh, the um, organization, news organization to reduce costs and not to have correspondence of reporters. And, um, and sometimes it seems also to be a deliberate practice from the news organization um, to, um, to um, deliberate practice to reduce the legal risk and to reduce therefore the cost. So when once we uh, interviewed the AFP Syria bureau chief, he explained that sometimes they believe that the risk is too high, so they decide not to send any journalists, knowing that the journalists will probably go anywhere, and they and the journalist knows as well that uh, if he goes, he will be able to sell his content. So it's a way to um, get the content and not um, um, have not, not take any legal risk. So here is uh, hypocrisy. And I will um, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ahmed. It's uh, it's really amazing and and really supportive with numbers, which we are going to discuss. Um, <clears throat> to save time, I'm going just to to give a small um, introduction to our first uh, panelist, uh, Mustafa Dahnoun. He's a Syrian journalist from north of. Uh, uh, North of Idlib city in Syria has two degrees, one in nursing and second in journalism. Now he's studying political, uh, political science and, and he participated in the rev revolution against the Syrian uh, regime as a civilian and then he moved to, uh, to, to more media activist work uh, to, to trying to, to present the, the story of what's happening in Syrian streets to the foreign audience and he has been a, a victim of two injuries due to this. Um, I, will, I will leave uh, to Mustafa to speak by his own words about his story and, and Mustafa, um, you, were, uh, you were working on in a very dangerous area uh, covering the, the, the situation there in a very conflict military zone and you have been injured um, I hope you are now better and we are really seriously looking to, to hear from you uh, on your experience and, and how has been situation on the level of protection first and second of the support. Also, if, uh, if you need it, we are all here ready to translate. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Yara, very much. I'm really glad to be with you here and to telling you my my experience. Actually, I want to start uh, speaking about myself. My name is Mustafa Dahnoun. Uh, I'm a journalist from the city of Idlib, northwest Syria. I have two degrees until now. First one in nursing, second one in journalism. And now I'm studying political science in the third year. Uh, actually, I learned the English by myself, I, the, the, maybe the uh, uh, education is very low, the standard of education in Syria is very, very low. Uh, so I learned the uh, English by myself. Uh, now I want to speak about my experience in the war zone in Syria. I, wa I was a normal person like anyone in the beginning of the war the beginning of the revolution in Syria. Like any revolutionary, uh, I had got out in demonstrations in this time. I, I, I saw the regime army, how killing and targeting the innocents who seek their freedom. And uh, I saw how bad they are. 
they were arresting the demonstrators in very bad ways, uh, pushing them, hitting them uh, very harsh. Uh, and this time, I thought that I have to find a way to tell the, the people in other countries, in the Western countries, what is going on in Syria and what the people need and how the regime replied. I started uh, as activist publishing the daily stories on my Facebook page, writing the painful stories about the displaced people in camps, uh, maybe also uh, putting the, the breaking news in my, my Facebook page as well. Uh, in 2015, I started working with local outlets uh, as correspondent, uh, and uh, it was quantum leap for, for me uh, to film reports and stories about the harsh situation in Syria, like displacement, refugees' lives, and massacres after bombing. I worked with several local, national, and international channels and outlets uh, in both uh, language in Arabic and English. On May uh, 2019, I was covering the conflict and warless war planes targeting in the north of Hama when uh, a Russian war plane targeted the place where I was standing by rockets. I had injured in my face, shoulders and chest and my cameras were destroyed because of the air raid. The missile was three or four meters far from me. I was able to see the rocket when it uh, exploded in front of my eyes. In the first uh, three or four seconds after the bombing, I started checking myself if I am alive, if I lost any part of my body. I checked my hands. Uh, yes, I can move them. My eyes, great, I can see. Then I put my right hand on my right part of my face and I saw the blood. Then I put the left uh, left hand uh, on my left part of my face and I saw the same. I'm bleeding. I was bleeding and I haven't, uh, I, I, I haven't uh, car near to me uh, because I, I booted my car maybe four or five kilometers far from me in, in the city of, of Khan Sheikhoun. Uh, I want to, to, to I want to write something to, to run away, but I haven't any, any, anything in my area because there's a lot of air raids in, in, in where, where I, I was. Uh, nobody here, all the people uh, run away, all the people flee away, uh, nobody in this, in this area. Uh, my friend who was with me, started screaming, we need help, we need help. Um, when, uh, so, I, I, we saw uh, 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 a car coming uh, and he, he, he started screaming uh, maybe uh, to, 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 to make them attention. Uh, so we get the car and started searching for hospital to cut the blood off. Maybe we searched in more than 10 villages, uh, but useless, we didn't find hospitals because the war planes were targeted the, all the, the hospitals in the north of Hama and south of Idlib. Uh, and the, the air raids made the, uh, the hospitals uh, out of service. I forced to travel for about 70 kilometers to find a hospital. I went to, to, to a hospital and I recovered. Few days later, I returned to my job covering the, the, the war in, in my region. Actually, maybe, maybe as I, I can remember, uh, seven days later, uh, I went to the same place covering the conflict in, 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 uh, in a town uh, called Al-Hammamiyat because the, the opposition fighter 
try to advance in this in this place uh, and there there were a lot of air raids a lot of uh, maybe uh, a lot of uh, artillery uh, artillery now uh, after after my my injured uh, a lot of charities and institutions which take care of, uh, of the journalists called me and promised me uh, that they will help me. But the just the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of uh, Exhibition and uh, charity called Rory Big Trust, uh, the only situ uh, institutions which helped me. Uh, now I'm working as a journalist, but the situation in the in the in, in Syria, in all of Syria, for the journalists uh, after COVID-19 turned uh, turned uh, upside down. None of the channels or outlets around the world interested in stories from Syria like before. And uh, I didn't find contract work since June. Um, maybe I can summary all of that by some words to explain how the journalists in, in, in war zones live. It's so difficult to be a good journalist in war zone. All the journalists face a lot of challenges and difficulties in their work. In their w work, the, the bad situation and uh, bad conditions to work surrounded the war journalists on every side. That's why the organizations and charities have to take care of them more and more because they are the eyes of the world, uh, especially uh, they, ha they, they, they have they have good protection. Uh, and I want to, to add one more idea that the journalists should take more trainings to raise their abilities and uh, make them better in work to avoid to avoid the uh, injured and to make them more professional. That all what I have, uh, I want to stop. Thank you, Mustafa, for sure. I hope we still have time to go back to you. I will go to, to, to Ayman, which is really hard to make a short introduction for your great CV, Ayman. Ayman is the executive, uh, is the executive director of Beirut-based Samir Kassir Foundation Sky Center for Media and Culture Freedom since 2011. <clears throat> He's also a visitor professor at the College, uh, College of Europe uh, from January 2016 in to, to February 2017. He was also the executive director of Global Forum for Media Development, GFND, a network of 200 member development and journalism assistance organization, uh, both at Samir Kassir Foundation and GFND. Ayman observe, uh, oversaw the organization of large scale conference workshops and festivals gathering hundreds of participants. He previously served a senior program officer for the National Democracy Institute of International Affairs 2007-2011. And as far as I know, Samir uh, Ayman, we have been working together a lot to support Syrian journalists. Uh, and, and this, based on the numbers, very worrying numbers of the report, 78% uh, of injured journalists has not received any security training, 84 journal injured journalists didn't have any uh, protection equipment i would i would seriously ask you from from your uh, experience as a director of um, samir kassir foundation about the challenges uh, you you have faced in the previous 10 years relating to syria or even now to push for more world uh, more protection or or mechanism to support thank you so much thank you yara um it's always um, an honor to be part of um, GFMD webinars and GFMD's life in general, but specifically on a topic as important as support for Syrian journalists. It was one of the uh, main areas of activity of GFMD to try to bring together all the international organizations that were supporting uh, the Syrian uh, nascent media scene, as well as several of Syria's most promising uh, media organizations. But since day one, it was clear that Syria is the most dangerous place in the world for journalists. Uh, unfortunately, the international attention on the plight 
of journalists in Syria only increased when international journalists were kidnapped or killed in Syria, which was tragic. At the same time, the number of Syrian journalists who were injured, who were, who were killed, who were kidnapped, remains one of the worst in, in the world in many conflicts similar to the Syrian uh, war. This is why we all need to ask ourselves that question about responsibility, about what else could have been done. When, when such a low number of journalists from Syria have received training on their safety, while at the same time, so many international organizations, so many local organizations have been organizing since 2011, safety trainings related to physical safety, digital safety, psychosocial safety. And at the end, only that limited number of people have been actually targeted. Well, who is, is there anyone to blame? Are we as international and regional organizations, uh, have we, has our work to identify the right people been weak? Were we only able to train those who were able to fly or actually go to Turkey or go to Lebanon where these trainings took place and we were not able to train those who were inside? Were there any failures in the mechanisms to organize training of trainers who in turn would go inside Syria and train the people who need it most? Well, all these questions remain and are very legitimate and we all have to ask ourselves, what could we have done better? At the same time, it's also not the right thing to do to you know, self-flagellate ourselves by thinking that had these organizations not done these trainings, 100% of the uh, journalists covering the war in Syria would have done it without the proper training. So maybe we can also look at it that we mitigated the risk and that given the size of the tragedy in Syria, asking international organizations, media development organizations, journalist safety organizations alone to put all the Syrian journalists in, in safety would be way too much to ask. It was a war where every single international power, regional power had invested so much in destroying, invested so much in killing. We cannot compare the impact of those who invested in saving lives with the impact of those who invested in killing. The, the, the balance is so, it's completely lost. And this is why let's not look at the, only at the negative, definitely learn from our experience there to improve, but also identify, uh, I mean, acknowledge that we also, all of us managed to help. And, and the question goes beyond what just happened in Syria. When it comes specifically to the issue of injured journalists, there is another question to ask about the responsibilities within the news cycle. So who, first asking ourselves who the employer was. Was the employer an international big news provider or was it a smaller national provider who is going or that is going through a very difficult budget uh, problems at home? Are we talking about one of the many uh, nascent Syrian organizations that was uh, created or launched after the conflict or was it also the situation that was mentioned earlier by Armand of unsolicited news providers who would actually produce news hoping that their content would be picked up. We cannot necessarily put everybody at the same uh, level, especially when we're talking about international organizations that have security protocols uh, and, and that is uh, that are expected to be also shared with the providers on the ground, specifically here, uh, the Syrian ones. And also we need to look at these international organizations regarding their own uh, practices. Are the European and American organizations bound by the same contractual and ethical obligations than, for example, Gulf-based organizations? Uh, definitely they have to be bound by the same high ethical uh, standards, but we, we have to conduct or actually complement, hopefully in the coming months, the study from the perspective of the employers, what are the policies uh, within each employer, both local, international, regional, etc.? And maybe we have to push for the big networks working from or out of Gulf countries to also abide by the same international standards that organizations in Europe or North America have.
have. The second main question is related to the responsibility of the donor. Of course, many journalists like uh, um, Mustafa earlier started because they felt they needed to tell the world the story of what was happening on the ground. But then media organizations were created and most of them, if not all, were created with donor funding. That the, who the donors were and did the donor include in their funding enough to also support training and security? Were the donors who are the media development organizations, members of GFMD, uh, abiding by the same standards than, for example, contractors who were not part of the media development business, but that got tremendous amounts of money from international donors in the US and the UK and also trained and created media organizations? Uh, were the same standards applied to both? That is also something to investigate and accountability needs to um, take place. And same for the end donor. So very often for those of you who know how the media development um, model works, there are you know, the end donors, the big development agencies, the big ministries of foreign affairs, sometimes even ministries of defense that provided money to intermediary organizations. Some of these intermediary organizations are contractors. Some others are media development organizations that have always worked in the media development and assistance business. Um, so where does the responsibility go? If, for example, the request for proposals from the end donors did not include do no harm principles, did not include support for safety, what are the questions to ask to them? And finally, not all safety trainings are equivalent. Many have gone through safety trainings, but these safety trainings were, for example, hotel based over a few days in an environment that was totally different from the one that was actually taking place on the ground. How much were these safety training uh, adapted to the realities and to the needs is also something to investigate in order to avoid further problems in the future. And in order to fix that situation or try to find a solution. Uh, you mentioned earlier the work of ACOS Alliance. Well, ACOS Alliance, a culture of safety, uh, in partnership with um, the Frontline Freelance Register and with also some support from my organization, the Samir Kassir Foundation, finalized the first model contract in Arabic in order for freelance journalists to have at least the minimum standards when they sign with their employers. So hopefully now uh, these standards will be respected. I believe that the model contract will be released by ACOS Alliance within uh, a couple of weeks, probably during the Arish conference, early December or end November in Amman, but it will be online. And this would actually provide probably a step forward uh, to a better future and more safety. Uh, I'm aware of the time. Thank you, Yara, and uh, probably we'll go back to some Q&A a bit later. Thank you so much, Ayman. It's really a very big um, topic, and I really hope to have two hours. We are uh, going to, to see if, if participants would accept to give us 10 minutes more from their time, because also Mustafa has a video for his injury, so it would be very, very good proof to what we are talking about, also to show in visual. Um, we will see how it goes. And now going to Ignacio, um, who's uh, Ignacio Miguel uh, de la Goda. Uh, I'm really sorry, Ignacio, I don't speak Spanish. Uh, he he um, has uh, worked as a freelance journalist uh, through, uh, throughout the Middle East, writing for publication in Belgium, Romania, Spain, and the United States on civil society, democratization, and the human rights issue. He served as a media analyst for the Open Secure Center uh, Europe Bureau for nine years and worked as a researcher, editor, and election monitor for the Cairo-based uh, Ibn Khaldun Center for Development Studies, a uh, period to join CBG, uh, Commission Protect Journalists in 2017. He worked as a lecturer in journalism at the Politikin, Politician uh, University of uh, Dohok. Uh, he earned his uh, Master in Journalism uh, from uh, com Politans University of uh, Madrid, and of course, uh, Ignacio speak four language, Arabic, German, Romanian, and Spanish. So feel free to see, ask Ignacio any question in any language you want. And my question for you, Ignacio, is this uh, amazing experience worldwide that you have it, and your 
very much expert in Syria, I know, very sure. Um, like uh, those attacks, those problems about how we can protect journalists, how we can provide more support for for uh, media workers who are working on, on conflict zone with less protection, less knowledge, less, uh, less uh, mechanism. Uh, it's not a Syrian issue. Maybe Syria put more uh, heavy weight related to the huge number of um, media workers, but in general, this is a problem we are facing uh, in so many places, Ukraine and other, and on, on this international wave, uh, uh, I want to ask about responsibilities, because we cannot ask governments to, to make any facilitations, as they are mainly part of the problem, but also where the United Nations stand and what kind of the support they are giving even to the international organization to provide more mechanism beyond the articles itself. Um, and I will stop here. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yara. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, ASML, for what I think is a great and very uh, necessary report uh, at this point. Uh, as Yara was saying, like I, I will try to focus my my intervention on regional trends. Uh, Shamsi was saying at the beginning that this report is focused on Syria, but he thinks, and I agree, that these conclusions could be applied elsewhere and definitely elsewhere in the region. So we have been provided with some numbers. Uh, let me also like provide like some more numbers first about Syria and then I would go about regional trends. So the numbers in Syria, like they paint a very green picture whenever we look at, at, at them, like especially concerning journalists and especially concerning local journalists and freelancers. So uh, to date, um, like we in CPJ, like we have documented uh, 138 killings of journalists in Syria and 90% of them were local and 38% of them were, were freelancers. Um, abductions, like we have had like never before have so many abductions been documented in a conflict zone as in Syria. So we had like, I think like over 100 cases of abducted journalists and that was partially what uh, led international organi media organizations and media outlets to start relying more heavily on local journalists uh, to report the news because it was no longer safe for international journalists to go into Syria and report the news from there. So that was part of what originated like this, uh, some of the problems that we have been discussing so far. Uh, in general, in the region, in in the Levant especially, like we are seeing a, a general worsening of, of press freedom. Uh, so it's it's Syria with these horrific numbers that we're mentioning, but it's also the neighboring country, Iraq. Like we have over 190 journalists have been killed there. Like we are seeing day in and day out, militias targeting journalists, uh, journalists being assaulted, like, um, uh, targeting outlets that are critical of, of their policies or the influence that they have on, on Iraqi politics. Um, another trend that we are seeing is like this increase in disregard and, and disparagement of journalists. Like this is not new in Syria. In Syria, like for years, journalists have been labeled as spies, enemies of the state and the like, by the, especially by, by the regime of, of Bashar al-Assad. But this is, there is this increasing rhetoric. Uh, we have seen it in Trump and we have seen regional leaders mimic this rhetoric critical of journalism and their work. Uh, again, like being labeled as, as enemies, being, uh, we have had the, the fake news rhetoric whenever there's any criticism of local leaders. So I think that's something that it's leading or has led to more journalists being targeted. Uh, again, across the region. Uh, one funny story that I would like to, to share with you all, it's funny and at the same time, it's tragic. Like on, on election day in, in the United States, Egypt, which have been cracking on uh, journalists right, left and center uh, over the past, uh, pretty much over since 2013, since CC took over. They announced like a release of journalists 
but they didn't release anybody just because they wanted to have like a better human rights record if Biden won, but at the same time, like covering their backs so they could put them in prison again in case that Trump won the election. So that's what I what I mean. Like we have had like this rhetoric, so critical of journalists, so uh, uh, so disparaging of journalists, uh, that many leaders in the Arab world uh, and in the region have felt involved and empowered to go after them with full impunity. With full impunity. Uh, we are also seeing that some countries in the regions that we have traditionally considered to be safe havens for journalists and for press freedom. Uh, we have also witnessed like a, a general worsening of, of press freedom. Like, uh, for example, Ayman can talk at length about this, but we have seen it in, in Lebanon. Uh, we are seeing more journalists being attacked when they are covering protests. Uh, we are seeing the army requiring permits um, uh, for journalists to be able to shoot in the, in the streets when it was it was in the practice. Uh, journalists being summoned by by general security by the cybercrime bureau, like without informing them of the reasons. Uh, so we are seeing like these trends. We are seeing the same thing in in Iraqi Kurdistan, which until recently was also considered safe, always for international journalists, not so much for local journalists who have always been facing like the same uh, kind of repression. And we have seen it in Jordan too. Uh, we have seen gag orders on journalists who were trying to cover the, the protests these years, more arrest of journalists. So this is part, as I said, of a, of a larger trend. So in short, and to summarize it, like we are witnessing like how journalists are becoming a target uh, regionally, internationally, and how impunity for attacks for crimes against journalists is rampant and widespread, and that's that's also part of the problem. Like we have seen very recently, we have like very good news um, about impunity. So two of the journalists who have been responsible, sorry, two of the terrorists who were responsible for the assassination of James Foley and Stephen Sotlow were transferred to the U.S. and will stand trial. Uh, we saw a U.S. court um, blaming the, the Assad regime for the killing of Mary Colvin. But then again, there are good news uh, for international journalists, but the same kind of justice is not served when it comes to local journalists. All what I'm saying goes to say, we still have a huge disparity between how international journalists have been treated and local journalists have, have been treated. And this gap, I think, is what we should focus on addressing. So with this uh, report uh, that uh, Armand has, has presented, uh, with some of the points that Ayman was making earlier, uh, as to who's to blame, like not who's to blame, but where can we find answers to all these questions, uh, I think we need to start like having that conversation. So all these initiatives that have been mentioned, like having like this Arab, uh, this contract in Arabic for uh, freelancers, like that's a first step. The conclusions of these reports are a great step, are a good signal. And now it's time just to slam and make this point with international com uh, media organizations so that they honor their commitment, so that they, they start respecting like, these rights. Uh, I think that's a conversation that we all should have, journalists, uh, media outlets, but also international organizations, so that we can reach out to as many journalists as possible and protect as many journalists as possible. So I will leave it here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ignacio. Impunity is seriously uh, mainly a huge problem we are handling. Um, um, before going back to close with Mustafa and open the floor for your questions, uh, we'll just, uh, we're going to show the video uh, showing uh, Mustafa injured as we sit and he is shares the screen. Um, I hope it works. الله أكبر الله أكبر مصطفى دحنون 
ما بعرف تحنون 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 اشو غيره محلكم غيره محلكم غيره محلكم اصابه بسيطه 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 طلع طلع بسيطه 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 لقدام 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 تعال 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 الطيران الحربي السوري يستهدف طاقم مراسي طاقم تلفزيون سوريا في غير بعيد لبعد جنوبي فاحما الشمالي لا لا ما في اسعاف اسعاف الحمد لله على السلامة يا مصطفى. Um, thank you everyone. Um, مصطفى, I will close with the question with you. Uh, if I may, uh, it's about like uh, after all these years in this work and all the stories you have been uh, living by yourself and, and, and witnessed from other colleagues uh, who give their lives unfortunately due to the access of, of medical support or difficulties to reach medical support or, or any kind of protection they needed. Um, what what do you think uh, it should be done to, to provide more protection or to enhance the situation in general, either from us as a Syrian organization, regional organization, international organization, or even United Nations? We cannot say like it's going to be done, but at least what we should push for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yara. Yes, uh, just. Uh... It's my opinion, no one able to protect the journalists in the conflict areas, because maybe I think just giving giving them uh, their rights, like good salary, good trainings, uh, give them uh, the their uh, secondary uh, secondary uh, expenses, uh, and maybe give them some equipments like cameras, microphones tribots, that will, will be good for them. Uh, I want to tell, tell you my, my experience. When I injured, uh, my camera is broken, okay? Who gave me uh, another camera to, to complete my, my job? No one, okay? Even my, my, my company, uh, I was correspondent for local channel. They didn't care, uh, care of me. They don't tell me, uh, they, they, the, the uh, manager didn't tell me, uh, thank God for your safety. Who cares? No one, okay? Just maybe giving the, the journalists some, some rights, like good contract, good, good salary, that will be fantastic for, for, for the journalists in the conflict uh, uh, zones. That uh, all what I have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, and the floor now is for the audience. Uh, please write your question, and and uh, if you can specify whom you are addressing in the question, it would be great. Or in general, um, the first question we have here is from Garrett Kolish, uh, and and. He's asking, I think, for you, Armin, um, from the report, what was the time period of the injured happened over? Um, he think he missed it a bit, and thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Um, so for the injuries, we decided to, um, to include as many journalists as possible. So any uh, journalists who got injured uh, after 2011, and until uh, the period where we started to circulate the, the questionnaires. 
so um, until uh, August 2019. So from basically March 2011 until August uh, 2019. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Armand. And I uh, please correct me, Michael, but I'm not so sure I'm seeing any see? more questions, which I hope to see. And I think so far, Yara, the, they're in the chat so far. I think there's a couple questions in the chat, but uh, yes, uh, everyone. Everyone, I, I highly, uh, I highly recommend that that you um, that you ask questions, and uh, we we do have some extra time here, so it's 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 fine. I can also un allow you to unmute yourselves in case you would like to speak. So, for instance, uh, Vanessa, you you have a question. I'm I'm going to give you the chance to, to speak. In fact, I'm actually going to give everyone here the chance to speak. Let me just in. Uh, um, I don't know if uh, you could help me, um, Jordan, just, just to expedite the process. It will allow everyone to talk. So in case you would like to speak or in case you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and, uh, and come directly in. So we, I mean, because we know who's here. Uh, okay, Michael, I can go. Hi, Vanessa, uh, please. Hi. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you everyone uh, for the very enlightening uh, talks, actually. It's a very interesting webinar. I have uh, a question for Mustafa and another one for Ayman. Uh, Mustafa, how do you think you can have avoided the injury uh, if you have received the safety training uh, before you actually uh, cover or, or before you go to a war zone or um, you put yourself into a dangerous situation? Do you, do you think a safety training would have helped you? And uh, Ayman, also, I have a question for you regarding the focus uh, on safety journalist training. Do you think we should focus more as the media development organizations on um, uh, focusing on media management, uh, the management of the news media organizations, rather uh, than only the journalists? Thank you. OK, yes. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell something very important that every uh, reporter in war zone should do that he, he must uh, wear a shield, okay? Because uh, after uh, uh, when I was in north of Hama, uh, I was wearing uh, a shoulder, a shield and uh, a helmet, but I, 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 uh, the, the shield uh, protect me very well uh, because uh, I was uh, so close to the missile. Uh, maybe, maybe if if, if you uh, do that, you will save your, your yourself. You will be uh, more safety than if you if you go to to uh, maybe uh, places very dangerous without shield. Okay. Uh, is that clear? Yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, the second question, uh, I think the, the, all the organizations should, uh, uh, all the organization should uh, train, train the, the uh, journalist and maybe uh, the, the uh, uh, the companies, the media companies, uh, should uh, tell their 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 uh, reporters that they have to stay away from from danger, uh, because uh, because the the main focus uh, is on the uh, media company than the re reporters, uh, and all the the uh, companies didn't uh, in, in, in our in our case in the Syrian case most of the local companies in media didn't care uh, about their their reporters so the organizations should uh, 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 maybe train the, the uh, media companies to take care of their their uh, reporters is, is that clear? Yes, Mustafa, thank you. Welcome.
Um, thank you, Vanessa. Always good to be in touch. Uh, look, first, when we talk about um, the training that they should have received before uh, going on the ground, well, training on safety is so complex and there are so many different layers. There is one training that is always needed for journalists, whatever the context, first aid training, it saves lives. And uh, you don't only need this um, training on first aid if you're on a, in a conflict zone. Well, we saw in Lebanon on, the, on August 4 that you could have been severely injured at your house. And journalists, and I have in mind too, and I'm, I would even be ready to share their names, uh, have actually expressed so much gratitude for safety trainings they have gone through because these safety trainings, specifically focusing on first aid, have helped them save themselves and save their families, uh, family members during the blast. And the same applies to those covering natural disasters. So safety training for journalists, both in terms of situational awareness, preparedness for vehicle safety. We all live in dangerous areas where people drive like crazy on the streets and we're not talking about war zones. Not being able to handle uh, roads, not being able to handle um, natural disasters or how to treat yourself and others after you're injured regardless of the circumstances would reduce your ability to share the news and therefore would reduce the ability of the public to know what happened. So it's an essential thing to be part of our culture. But you're totally right. We cannot only ask individual journalists to go through it if there is no support from the management. And this is where the cultural shift needs to happen. Sometimes safety trainings take place over four days, three days, five days, or sometimes over longer period of time. If there is no support and investment from the company, from the management to provide their staff with the ability to spend time getting training, it won't uh, move forward. And also they have a role to play. Communication protocols are part of safety trainings. The role of your employer in terms of insurance, in terms of when to inform, when not to inform other people of what was happening is part of a safety training. The bird's eye view that someone in management can have over a situation on the ground when the journalist is only covering a demonstration and is not aware of what was happening two streets away is also part of the safety training. So we need a very holistic, very comprehensive approach to safety training. And this can only happen in our region if the syndicates, the unions, the groups of representing journalists gain enough power and negotiation power to impose that in the conversation, in the contracts with the employers, as long as the situation in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Jordan is what it is. And I'm talking here about journalist unions that are actually puppets in the hands of their political patrons. And rather than actually representing the interests of journalists, we will not move forward on that front. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions that they would like to, to oh, there's a hand raised. Uh, Sophia, please, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Shukran and thank you for, for this time and this very, very insightful uh, report and webinar. Um, I'm in representation of SFGN, Syrian Female Journalist Network, and agreeing with Ayman when what you said about the holistic approach needed on safety, I have a question for all the panelists regarding the protection of women, uh, citizen journalists and media workers, and how can we ensure that there is restorative actions in terms of sexual harassment and violence toward women uh, working in the field, um, and what's your approach and your opinions on, on the efforts taken so far? Thank you. As it's for all the panelists, I would I would suggest uh, Ayman, uh, Ignacio, uh, Armand, and then maybe we can close with Mustafa. I don't know. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. I will start if it's okay with everyone. Like I agree, Sophia. Thanks a lot for your question. Um, the topic of sexual harassment uh, is has just begun to be introduced, usually in hostile environment trainings. 
like until now I know from female colleagues who have complained about this part. So this is something that I think like will be gaining traction in, in the next years and as, as these trainings go forward. But it has been for a long time a concern that has not been addressed and and it needs to be. So it would it's it has just started to be included. Uh until now it was like an afterthought and uh like sadly that has uh, implication on the ground. Uh, it's very hard to to address uh, the situation for for female journalists. Like in some contexts, usually in in conflict zones, it has been my experience uh, that female journalists uh, are not as targeted and usually can get to places where men cannot, uh, which is um, it's just a curious point but in context of protest and unrest i think they are still more vulnerable especially to sexual harassment like we saw it in in egypt like it became a sort of a uh, weapon or that the authorities would use to spread fear among female protesters and journalists so that they wouldn't go to cover or they wouldn't go on the street uh, to protest. So this is certainly uh, something that um, that needs to be included in those in those trainings. But it's also a concern that I think like media organizations should take into account uh, when they send uh, female reporters on the ground. Yes, uh, adding to Ignacio, uh, I would actually um, go again to the idea of a very holistic. Uh, approach to, to safety um, that includes all the stakeholders. One of the stakeholders that is often ignored are the producers of the shields, vests, and helmets. It starts here. Actually, more than 90%, if not 95% of the equipment is not designed to fit women's body. So if you start with that, uh, uh, problem is that the vests are not designed for women or, or shields, you are putting women at a higher risk because they cannot be as, um, uh, they cannot move as uh, fast or with the same level of, um, you know, flexibility with, with vests and shields and helmets designed for men. It starts here. And it goes much further, as you mentioned, to issues related to sexual harassment. And why I say it's a holistic approach. We cannot have a culture of safety that is only looking at first aid once you're injured or at communication protocol. A culture of safety means the integrity of the body and mind. And this is, this has to be part of what a team understands when you have a crew composed of male and female journalists, what the, the management needs to understand and needs to uh, cre uh, create very strong policies within organizations related to sexual harassment, related to sexual abuse. And we have a very weak culture of that, unfortunately, in most Middle East and North African countries um, with very limited protection for uh, sexual harassment. The Lebanese parliament only adopted in a first reading in the committees a law against sexual harassment in the workplace just yesterday. No text exists on that matter. And I believe the situation is much worse in other countries in the region. Um, so if you don't have a legal uh, protection and at the same time, you don't have the culture within your organizations, uh, you cannot expect people to be truly protected, women to be truly protected. And the situation is horrible across the region. I would very highly recommend everybody watch the uh, amazing report by uh, Iraqi journalist Assad al-Zalzali. Um, Assad, who won the Samir Kassir Award twice in 2017 and 2018, was a finalist in 2020 for a, an impressive report on sexual harassment targeting journalists in Iraq, female journalists in Iraq. It's one of the most comprehensive report surveys ever done there. And if the situation is as bad as Iraq, I would actually defy uh, any other Arab country to actually show better trends or significantly better trends. The numbers from Denmark are jarring. So let look at the situation then in, in most of our countries. If there is no real push against this prevailing patriarchy 
patriarchal mentality within news organizations, we cannot uh, truly provide our female colleagues with the protection they deserve and that uh, readers and watchers and the audience deserve to have access to truly uh, safe information. Because if you, I'm not safe, you're not safe in providing the news, then the news I get is not of the quality I deserve. Uh, before Mustafa, maybe. Yeah, well, um, I think what what was covered by Ignacio and, and Eamon are, are pretty comprehensive, and um, I agree with uh, the holistic approach that starts with uh, with the manufacturers. Um, it's, um, I mean, it's true that even in the in the projects carried out by SML, we saw like because there was a program to train uh, female journalists and we saw like lots of different type of problem that was uh, faced by, uh, by, um, by um, women journalists, female journalists, especially harassment and um, defamation campaigns on the social networks. And sometimes um, we also saw like a great um, reaction from, uh, from local community and from fellow journalists who stood up to defend um, the, the journalist and who started um, all the campaign to um, and so I guess like the, the the part of the solution might be like the ability of the sector to um, to show solidarity and uh, and um, and uh, yeah support each other. Um, I just also want to cover uh, just a couple of points, which I, I did not really have um, time to, um, to to cover in, during the presentation, is about recommendations. Um, <clears throat> I think one of the recommendations um, to try to improve the situation, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere, is obviously to, it's part of the NGO um, media development sector. Uh, it's in the end of uh, media development sector, not to provide the training, not necessarily to provide the support to uh, to um, to injured journalists, but as the capacity of the NGO sector to lobby um, media organization, so they can obviously better equip and train the local journalists or stringers, and that they don't make any difference between um, the way they treat local journalists and their own uh, international staff. Uh, the second thing obviously, and it goes with um, what Eamon talked about um, for the, the conflate uh, contract for freelance um, in Arabic, English, and uh, is um, to educate also local journalists about their rights and protection to which are ent entitled. So I guess this would be more like uh, at the hands of the NGO sector to make sure that local journalists are aware that they're not alone and they have rights, even though they don't have an actual staff or salaried contract. And the last thing I think would be to bring the issue of unsolicited uh, content at the discussion table on the issue of uh, journalist safety. Because I, I'm, that's my personal point and that's, it's not something I, I see at the discussion table when we're talking about safety of journalists. However, I believe that if um, a news organization which is publishing content is not able to provide or does not have, do, doesn't consider that they have any obligations towards someone if they publish content already available, then they should not publish content already available because they should have uh, obligations towards the person that captured the content for all of the publications. So um, I believe that if we have like all their obligations met towards the staff journalist, but if they, but they have like 80% of their publication is from unsolicited content or already, of, um, already available material, then I think we have a systemic problem. Um, so I would, yeah, I guess um, uh, recommend to bring this issue um, during the next phase of the ACOS Alliance uh, discussion. And, and, and I hope that um, is something that will be brought to the discussion table. Thank you. Thank you, Armand, Ayman, Ignacio, it's, it's, uh, and thank you for the question. Abir, thank you for sharing the links. It's, it's, uh, it's very important. And I will give the, the, the final comment to, on this question to Mustafa, who's living in Idlib, and he's very aware of all the difficulties and own realities that women journalists are facing. Mustafa, it's, it's on with you. Thank you, Yara. Uh, in my opinion, uh, it's 
very difficult to be a, a journalist uh, in war zone and it's uh, more difficult for uh, for 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 women okay actually there are few female journalists in Syria because we have uh, our eastern customs and most of female journalists work as writers without showing their faces or maybe uh, their real name for me i support the woman uh, who needs to work as a reporter in Syria to show the people around the world uh, our brave and great women maybe uh, just uh, in my in my experience uh, for for uh, maybe 6 years of, of covering the war in Syria i didn't see uh, a lot of female journalists uh, I, I i i saw maybe two or three uh tv uh, reporters uh in our in our area uh, i told you why because we have our our own customs our own own tra traditions uh that all that i have Um, thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are going to close. Um, I'm sure uh, Michael, Ehrman, Chancy, uh, Ignacio, Ayman, everyone, Mustafa, um, they are more than welcome. And me, of course, uh, to, to have any questions you have later on the report, Ehrman is the best to address. And uh, you will have your response uh, very, very soon and short time, I'm sure. And um, thank you so much. And I will give the floor to Michael.